Um, we'll just begin by uh, <clears throat> just doing a short chant. Arahang Samma Sambuddho Bhagavā Buddhang Bhagavān Thang Abhivāde <coughs> Svākato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasāmi Supati Panno Bhagavato Sawaka Sangho Sanghang Nama Well, um, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to see that there are some people here today. I, I realize the title of this talk. Um, may have encouraged some people not to bother thinking, oh, we're just going over old ground today. <laughs> I thought maybe they tuned in on the wrong week looking for fairy tales and radiant minds, which sounds a lot more appealing in, in many ways. Um, I'll, I'll explain the reason why I chose the title uh, a little bit later, but uh, it, kind of resonated with me for a number of reasons. One was um, to do with lockdown. I imagine that lots of you are in a similar position to me and, uh, and go out walking regularly. I like to get out pretty well every day these days to go for a walk. But if I just go for a short walk, um, very soon I find that I'm going over old ground, <laughs> sort of, it's very easy to kind of go round and round the same, uh, the same places that, uh, that we do regularly. And on one level, I guess you could, you could say, well, that sounds pretty boring. <laughs> going over old ground like that, just walking around the same routes. You know, it's always it's always interesting to go somewhere new, isn't it? You know, we like to get off and go to other places, places we've never visited before and, and see new things. Um, but interestingly, one of the remarkable things about being tied down and going around the same routes so often is the number of new things that you see in the old places. I don't know whether other people have had this experience as well. It kind of makes me feel that a lot of the time I've, uh, I've wandered around in a bit of a dream because there are so many things going on that I haven't noticed before. Um, I mean, not, um, there are obvious things. Uh, every day you go out and the light's a bit different and the bird song's a bit different or the noises, the people that you bump into. Uh, but I've also noticed things about places that I thought I knew. Uh, you know, just sort of interesting details in buildings and uh, and and nice gardens that I'd never noticed before. And it, it sort of just made me think, actually, that there's something about this notion of going over old ground that's, that's actually very useful. And I was trying to think what it was that, that kind of made it different for me. Because, as I mentioned before, it sounds rather boring. And I, I don't know how many people are familiar with the notion that actually boredom is in some places it's given as one of the hindrances we're all familiar with the five hindrances but sometimes in some places they give six or even seven and the seventh hindrance as i remember is boredom and i was kind of thinking of what, what is this word i looked it up in pali it's a word called arati and um Arity means something like dislike or discontent. 
And I was sort of thinking, well, how, how is that different to ill will? And it isn't, boredom isn't like ill will in a way. The, the way I explained it to myself was that boredom is sort of like a combination of desire and ill will. It's, it seems to fall in between the two. It's sort of that notion of wanting something, maybe not knowing what it is that you're wanting. Uh, I want something, but not this, <laughs> whatever it is. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in this place. I don't want to be with that person because that's boring. It's just kind of going on and on. It's going over old ground. And it's interesting that that's, that's a hindrance. It's not, uh, it's not something intrinsic about the nature of the place or the people. It's something in us. It's a hindrance in us. And so actually we have this notion of uh, overcoming hindrances in practice. And, you know, the walking has become a bit of a practice in, in overcoming the hindrance of boredom and looking for something new every day. I think the thing that's, that I found particularly useful has been uh, the notion of opening the senses and actually going out with the senses wide open, not getting caught on, on those kind of desires and formless desires, but actually just, just looking around and, uh, and being open. So just to start off, you know, just to say that going over old ground isn't such a bad thing. And actually, when I gave the title to Veronica, she immediately came back to me and said, oh, that's very appropriate for this time of year. Uh, because it's the spring and people will be getting back in their gardens and, and going over the old ground to, to grow something new. And so that sort of took me off on another train of thought, really, to, uh, to think about gardening, because gardening uh, is, seems to be a very useful analogy for practice. Um, it's very interesting what happens if you just leave old ground. If you just leave it alone, uh, things do tend to grow there. It's surprising, you know, as soon as a, a bit of ground goes to waste, unless there's something really toxic in there, something does grow. But it may not be what we want. Uh, Often the things that are growing are, are, are weeds and, and things that we're not so keen on, but not always. Sometimes there's some very, very pleasant and, and useful stuff on, on old ground. But um, if you want the old ground to be fruitful, then you need to pay attention to it. It's rather like uh, going for walks. You know, you need to pay attention in some way. Uh, you need to feed it. It's very important if you want things to grow that you that you feed it in some way. Um, sometimes you have to break it down a bit as well and actually just sort of break things up and add some food, sort of remove things. You have to remove the weeds, but you have to you have to add something in there. Um, and knowing when to do these things is actually quite important uh, and tends to come with experience. The more you try to do those things, the more you know when to do those things. When is it time to actually just break things up? When is it time to add something new? When is it time to... When I say add something new, often the things that we're adding are, are quite old, in fact. They're, they're recycled, usually. Compost, manure, you know, all the sort of stuff that's been through the system somewhere, and we add it to the soil, and it makes it fruitful. So I thought, well, that, that's quite interesting. And, and when I, the more I thought about it, the more I began to think about uh, the, uh, the themes that we cover in these talks and in classes and in groups. And I was thinking, well, actually, it's all old ground, isn't it? 
that this is what we do. This is what practice is. In a way, it's a, it's an analogy for practice. Uh, it seems to be a recurring theme in the teaching that there's actually something quite ancient that we're tapping into. Uh, I find it very interesting that we have this uh, tradition of Buddhas before the Buddha that we know, Gautama Buddha, that there are, sometimes they talk about 24 Buddhas, sometimes they talk about 28 Buddhas, we do a chant of the 28 Buddhas. And what the Buddha says is that actually he's been going over ground established by a previous Buddha who was going over ground established by one before that and one before that and one before that. And actually the Dhamma is in a sense something very ancient, something timeless, because it's just beyond time. It's, it's unthinkable, really. Um, and, and that's quite interesting. That actually what we're, when we contact Dhamma, when we feel we have some taste of Dhamma, that we're actually touching on something very ancient. And I, I came across, I knew there were sort of references somewhere. I came across one which I'll read out to you. And this is from the Samyutta Nikaya. And uh, the, this is the Buddha speaking. The Buddha says, suppose bhikkhus, a man wandering through a forest would see an ancient path, an ancient road traveled upon by people in the past. He would follow it and would see an ancient city an ancient capital that had been inhabited by people in the past with parks, groves, ponds, and ramparts, a delightful place. Then the man would inform the king or a royal minister, Sire, know that while wandering through the forest, I saw an ancient path, an ancient road traveled upon by people in the past. I followed it and saw an ancient city, an ancient capital that had been inhabited by the people in the past with parks, groves, ponds and ramparts, a delightful place. Renovate that, sire. Then the king or the royal minister would renovate the city and sometime later that city would become successful and prosperous, well populated, filled with people, attained to growth and expansion. He then goes on to say that he actually found this ancient path, the path that was trodden by Buddhas before him, the, the Eightfold Path, if you like. I, I emphasize one line there, which was the line where he said, renovate it, sire. <laughs> Very interesting that you have to find the ancient, the timeless, but you have to renovate it. It, it reminded me of the, also the story that many of you will know in the Parinibbana Sutta, where um, the Buddha is very close to passing away and is still wandering with Ananda and comes to a place sort of more or less in the in the middle of nowhere and ananda says you know don't don't stay here <laughs> this is you know there's there's nothing here and the buddha then says no ananda this this sort of little one horse town that we're in used to be a great city it was the city of the great king the great king of glory used to inhabit this city and in actual fact that you know they having told him the story about this ancient city the buddha then goes on to pass away there and now that place 
is teeming with people. There are people go there from all over the world to visit this place where, where the Buddha passed away. So in some way, it was very ancient and it was given a new meaning and a new life. And I think this is very relevant for us because this is the nature of what we have to do with Dhamma, that uh, we're often on the lookout for something new. But in actual fact, it often if we look back over old texts or old teachings, things that we've heard before, and then find a way of bringing it to life, it becomes new, rather, rather like the old ground that becomes fruitful, that something has to die away. Maybe that sense of boredom, <laughs> not wanting to know about it. And we have to feed it in some way. So how do you, how do you feed it? And I, I would say that one of the ways that you feed it is by putting it into your own words. You have to find a way of bringing the things that you come across in classes, in readings, in talks. You have to bring those to life for yourself. And it's the act of trying to put it into your own words, to relate it to your own experience that actually brings it alive. I've been having conversations with some people recently and realizing that actually we've been talking about going back over things that were read several years ago, which now have a completely different meaning. They're alive in a different way because experience has changed. We've kind of, we've changed in some way and what was something that you thought you knew actually has a new meaning now. And I think if we take opportunities, then these opportunities, like giving talks, giving, having to give a talk, having agreed to give a talk, I should say, I did agree to it. Um, uh, that gives you an opportunity. It gives you an opportunity to chew things over again sort of rework the ground, just break it up a bit, have a look at it again, see what's there. Let's see what else, see what new things are growing this year. You know, what's, what's happening now? But those, those opportunities also occur for uh, people who are invited to teach. I think it's important that people who, who teach uh, reformulate what they've been told there's a, there's a very old saying that uh, somebody who, who will be familiar to, to some, some of the old crowd <laughs> um, used to say, knowledge is not information. It's not about hearing information and passing it on. That's not knowledge. If all we do is just look at old stuff, and regurgitate it for someone else, it doesn't come alive, it's not alive. So we have to look at the old and we also have to bring it alive in our own experience and our own words. What does it mean to me? So anything that I'm saying now means something to me, but if you want to do something with it, then you need to chew it over and you need to allow it to digest. You might need to allow it to lie fallow for a bit, like a piece of ground, or you might want to plant something of your own in there and let something else new arise. But I think that's very important for all of us, actually. And, he, and you know, the Buddha said, you know, don't just believe what I say test it for yourself. What, what was he saying? He's saying there's an ancient path, but somehow we have to make that ancient path new. We have to renovate it, make it ours, bring it alive. The Dhamma is here and now in the moment. It's to be experienced here and now. 
So very important message. But I think it's also, uh, it is important to kind of check uh, what uh, we think we know. And that kind of brings me on to uh, the starting point for all this, which was the title of this talk, really. Um, when I was asked if I'd, I'd give a talk, I, I pondered on it for a day or two, thinking I'm not, not sure I've got anything I particularly want to talk about. And then something popped into mind. Uh, and it was to do with the Brahma Viharas. And I thought, oh, yeah, I could do, do a talk on that. And so um, I agreed to give a talk. Um, and, and then I thought, oh, actually, we've already had two talks on the Brahma Viharas. <laughs> um, there may be more, but I remember two that were titles, had titles related to Brahma. Um, and uh, I'll give another plug to the YouTube channel here because uh, it encouraged me to go back and look at those talks because for various reasons, I didn't go to either of the previous talks. So I didn't know what had been said. And so I went back and I think the very first talk that was given actually was on the Brahma Viharas. And I went back and I thought, oh, I'll watch that. And it was really good. And I thought, well, actually, this says what I want to say. <laughs> it's, it's been done. This has been done. And, uh, you know, I had a bit of a, a, a rethink there. I was sort of thinking, oh, I mean, maybe I better think about something else. You know, I better, I better come up with a new idea. And that was when the thought came to me that there, there is actually no harm in going back over old ground looking at it again now me looking at it rather than somebody else to make it real for me and hopefully to give some basis for exploration for for you as well and so that was when the title came going over old ground i thought great i'll go i'll go over old ground those of you that have done group work will be quite familiar with this you know you come you go to a a meeting you know there's a dozen people there and you've all been looking at the same material and you go into that meeting thinking oh it's like this you know you've thought it through this is the way it is and then you listen to somebody else and they see it in a different way and then you listen to someone else and they've got another view and by the time you've heard all of the different views and experiences of different people it's it's become something else so that that uh, sort of reassured me that uh, it was okay to go back over old ground anyway <laughs> that was my that was my my kind of get out clause but like I say, I thought, well, I'll, I'll go back and actually check what he said about the Brahma Viharas, because the thing I wanted to say, which was said in the very first talk, is that when I was first taught meta practice, it didn't work. And I would say for probably the majority of the time that I've been doing meta practice, it didn't work for me. Uh, uh, it was mentioned in the first talk that often when people were told to arouse meta, the first thing that would arise would be a sort of lump in the middle of your chest and a sort of like a sense of aversion in some way. And uh, it just and every time people talked about developing warm feeling and love, it used to go the opposite way for me. And I thought, you know, this. This can't be right. <laughs> this can't be right. But I'd struggled with it and I'd had some ideas about it. And I thought, I'll go back and see what's in the text. And uh, this is more old ground for me because uh, when I did a talk before, it was about the Visuddhimagga, which I'd been reading about. And the Visuddhimagga is a good old fallback and, of course, has a section about the practice of the Brahma Viharas. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know that. Uh, if you go to the suttas and so on, there often isn't very much advice about practice, but the Visuddhimagga does, you know, give you suggestions along with 
uh, the Vimutti Magga, which is another one which I've referred to, and one called the Patisambada Magga. So I'm, I'm going to refer to those. And I'm going to give you a few of uh, just, uh, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but I'd like to just bring up and share with you some of the things that are said about the practice of the four Brahma Viharas. So uh, this is where we go to screen sharing time. Uh, and hopefully, right, okay. It's not full screen yet, Ian. Is that? That is screen? now, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so... When we, when the Visuddhimagga describes the practice of developing the divine abidings, um, it goes through, it goes into a lot of detail and it's talking about developing the divine abidings as, as a meditation practice. Uh, these are a part of the 40 kamatana, the 40 different objects that people can use for practice. But when I went through it, it kind of said some things which, which quite surprised me. The first one, one of the first thing it says is that we develop metta to seclude the mind from hate, which I guess is fairly obvious, but also introduce it to patience. And I thought that was a rather interesting notion because I don't remember anybody particularly talking to me about patience. And I don't, actually, I don't remember being particularly patient when doing meta practice, <laughs> particularly when it was, uh, when it was, you know, rather unpleasant. Um, I, I wasn't very patient with it. And I thought, well, actually, this is, this is very, very interesting. And the Vimutti Magga says something even more interesting because the Vimutti Magga has a very short sentence where it says, patience is power. Interesting. <laughs> patience is power. It protects the body and gives confidence. So that was a, a slightly different take for me. I won't, I won't dwell on these because, like I say, I think the, the main thing is that these, if we're going to make these meaningful, then you have to find meaning in it. You have to find your own meaning in it. We usually begin meta practice by developing it towards ourselves. And uh, the Visuddhi Magga explains, said, well, you, you won't find this in the suttas anywhere. It doesn't actually say, have loving kindness towards yourself, but it is a good thing to do because having a form of loving kindness towards yourself acts as an example for the mind. It provides the mind with an example. So it's not an end in itself, it, but it's a, a kind of useful tool along the way. And then it, there was a very interesting statement. To break down the barriers develop meta towards others, beginning with a dearly loved friend. So there's an assumption here, first of all, that you've developed meta towards yourself. So this is when you're actually doing the practice, the jhana practice of, uh, of loving kindness, that you begin with somebody who's dear to you, and usually they say a member of the opposite sex, and 
uh, sorry, a member of the same sex and uh, and uh, somebody who's alive. <laughs> Otherwise, the practice doesn't work so well. But I, I found this expression, breaking down the barriers, very interesting. Because it seemed to be saying something more about metta, that metta wasn't about uh, developing a powerful strong feeling it was something about allowing barriers to break down there was a, there was also a very interesting comment that was made again in the visuddhimagga where it says metta is melting it is a solvent metta is a solvent for breaking down barriers and it's easier to do that with oneself and with someone who is dear to one. And then, as I'm sure a lot of you know, you move on to other people, eventually to somebody who's, who's fairly hostile. But another interesting point that was made, which I haven't put on here, it says that if you are unable to destroy hate, do not develop metta. And I think that would have been very helpful for me to, to know a bit more clearly back in the days when I used to try and do metta practice. And actually what was coming up was some kind of aversion. It's not, not on, I don't think it's unnatural. I've heard lots of other people talk about it, particularly when you first come to it. Sort of at the right time, if the mind is very peaceful, relaxed, then maybe this notion of breaking down barriers is a lot easier. But if it's having the wrong effect, what it, what, interestingly, what it says is there are different ways then that you need to go to overcome resentment. It gives a very long list of them. I'm not going to go into all of those, but most of them are involved with insight in some way. They're actually looking into the nature of oneself and others and karma and how karma works. So, if it's not, if you don't have a pleasant feeling there, that's not a problem. It just means you just need to have a look at what's going on. Just notice what's going on. So there's then a whole section. Uh, that The section on getting rid of resentment is very long, very interesting. But again, you can explore that for yourself. There is actually a long section on the breaking down of the barriers and once again for a comment that came up this is one of the first lines that was there over and over again practice metta until mental impartiality towards the four persons i've listed them there is accomplished rather interesting isn't it we're doing metta, and it's talking about mental impartiality. It's talking about peka, isn't it? That the aim of doing this practice is not the de development of powerful feeling. It's to actually move towards equanimity, towards different people, including ones you like, ones you've never met before, you've got no feelings towards, and people that you don't like, and have an impartiality to them. And it gives a rather wonderful little simile. And the, the way you know that you've been successful, but if bandits demanded a sacrifice, and there's those four people there, you're there with the three others, a dear person, a neutral person, and a hostile person, only when you cannot choose one above the others are the barriers broken down. <laughs> so that's, that kind of gives you a sense of where, <laughs> where you're aiming for eventually. That actually you see, you see no reason, 
you know, there's no reason to sacrifice yourself. There's no reason to get rid of the person that you dislike or the one that you don't know, because you see all beings equally. And it says, it goes on to say that when the heart, uh, the chitta, or the mind possibly, is imbued with metta in all six directions, everywhere and equally. The, the mind does not make the distinction, this is another being. Okay, which is a, these are all ways of talking about the same thing, the mental impartiality seeing no distinctions. So again, a little bit of a surprise, not really what I've often associated with the practice of metta. Goes on to talk about karana and basically says that all, all the same things apply, all the same things that you did when you were, were practicing metta apply when you're developing compassion. Only this time, to make it easier, it's better to begin with an unlucky person, somebody who's not having a good time. That might be you, uh, it might be somebody else. We'll say a little bit more about this in a moment, because as you know, compassion is about uh, the heart being moved at the suffering of others. So it's to do with seeing dukkha. But interestingly, it doesn't mean getting rid of dukkha. If, if dukkha is overcome in some way, that is good. But it's quite clear that the aim is not to get rid of dukkha, but to break down barriers and dwell undisturbed. Uh, the story that came to mind for me here was that story that I'm sure you're familiar with. It's often called the story of the mustard seed, where uh, a young woman comes to the Buddha uh, having just lost her child. She, I think, a baby had died and she was distraught and came to the Buddha and I mean, the Buddha could have just sort of put his arms around her, there, oh, oh, I am sorry for you, dear, you know, and all this kind of thing. Or, or he might have burst into tears and felt really unhappy. But what, what the Buddha said to her was, go and visit each of the houses in the village. And wherever you find somebody who hasn't experienced the loss of a loved one, collect a mustard seed from that house. And she sets off because she has faith in the Buddha. And as you can imagine, she goes around all the houses and cannot find anybody who hasn't experienced loss and suffering. And so it's very interesting, the Buddha's reaction there is that he's not trying to shut away the dukkha, not rejecting it, or, oh, you know, make it go away. Equally is not holding on to it and getting brought down by grief, but remains undisturbed and finds a way of being with dukkha. Being with it without rejection and without attachment. Now, this, this isn't in the Visuddhimagga. This was something I threw in here because it one of the things that had been coming to me and why I thought there was something to talk about was because I think Karana could be seen as a symbol in a way. And it would say something about the way people often are. Some people have a tendency, some of us have, to have a tendency to see dukkha, 
we see dangers in things. Oh, if I do that, oh, this is going to happen. You know, there'll be a problem there. Some people's minds go that way. It's a natural thing. I, I've labeled that the dark. Um, I, I don't mean it, you know, it's not, it is, it's meant to be a slightly loaded expression, but, uh, you know, I don't mean people have gone over to the dark side or anything like that, but it's, it's kind of a, a slightly pessimistic view of the world. Yeah. I'll go on to say that I don't think it's any better or worse than being optimistic and being drawn to the light. But I think I think Karana, that Karana as a as a sort of backdrop for that way of seeing the world is quite a useful way of looking at things. With Mudita, uh, same kind of things. This time you begin with a glad person could be yourself you may be glad about something and you can have sympathetic joy for that but you begin with a glad person who is at peace or is making merit you break down the barriers just like we did before you need to find a way of breaking down the barriers being impartial to that rather like the buddha did with uh, with the the lady whose whose child had died being impartial being undisturbed but without a barrier to it don't reject people who are glad don't get attached to people who are glad and interestingly uh, it's saying that if the person that you think of or if it's yourself if you're not happy at the moment then actually going back to past happiness is a good way to develop mudita to actually remember good times yeah is also a way of doing things and rather like karana i think there's a an underlying tendency in some to be drawn towards what i've called the light that some people see the positive they see the possibilities in situations rather than the dangers yeah uh, i put i put the word light in i remember a little comment from nai boonman that he gave on one of his courses and uh, when he was talking about nimittas and i it's always stuck with me he just in a, it was a sort of throwaway comment where he just said everybody has a light in them and I thought that is the absolute epitome of mudita, <laughs> just knowing that everybody has a light in them. Everybody's got the potential to change. And again, I mean, there's the story of the, the mustard seed seemed relevant to Karina, the, the uh, story of Angulimala is, uh, could symbolize mudita. Angulimala, a serial killer, and who goes chasing after the Buddha. And the Buddha doesn't reject him. He doesn't identify with him, but he sees the possibility for change. He sees the potential. There's, uh, there's also King Ajatasattu in the Samanyapala Sutta, who's killed his father, but who, yes, you pay for your actions but the possibility is still there you know the possibility for change is still there and i think with both of these with karana and mudita if you reject them it leads you to the far enemy yeah you kind of you move towards hate when you reject things but if you identify with them you move towards the near enemy if you identify with the positive in people too much then you, there's a tendency to get excited yeah and so 
we move on to Upeka. And here, interestingly, they give an order. They say, begin with a neutral person for developing Upeka, then a dear person, then a hostile one, and finally come to oneself, finally have Upeka for oneself. And it also says that Upeka is the purification of the first three Brahma Viharas. It's interesting that in the development of metta, the first one that was mentioned, it was saying the aim is mental impartiality. I'm saying actually quite a, quite a difficult aim to actually be in a place where you see all, no distinction between oneself and anyone else. And it's, it talks about seeing dangers. There, there's a danger in going to sorrow. And as we know, karana can lead to sorrow. There's a danger in enjoyment. Mudita can lead to enjoyment or excitement. And so Upeka, the way I've been seeing it recently is that it's to do with being in the middle. Upeka is about being in the middle and holding both of the other states, that we are open to the dukkha, which is there, to the extent that we can be. I'm not, I wouldn't want to be unrealistic about this and, or even recommend that people open up fully to dukkha. Maybe, maybe a bit much, so not to be recommended. But equally, you need to be open to the possibility for change, the potential for change, and to find a place of peace which holds both of those. So that's, those are the, the points that I, I wanted to add to what's been said before. And I think there's, there's a lot to chew over there, so I, I don't want to dwell any more on it, but I'll just throw in a couple of other things which come up as a general comments that relate to all the Brahma Viharas. And I found this very intriguing as well, that it talk, there's a section called purpose, and it said the purpose of developing the Brahma Viharas is the bliss of insight and excellent future existence. So very interesting expression, the bliss of insight. So not at all, again, what I thought of as Brahma Vihara practice. Uh, and this was something that came up through uh, another one of those books, the Patisambada Magga where it talks about the, 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 um, the mind deliverance of metta. Metta that is uh, a way of freeing the mind. And it's accomplished, and it mentions three different ways through the faculties. It does also say that they can become powers if they become unshakable. The practice of metta can be developed through the seven bojangas, and the practice of metta can be developed through the Eightfold Path. And it just sort of occurred to me that if you think about the faculties, the beginning of that process is to begin with faith, but the end result is wisdom. If you begin with the bojangas, you begin the practice with mindfulness and it leads to equanimity at the end of that list. And if you begin with the path, it begins with right view. It begins with wisdom and seeing clearly and it ends with right samadhi. So, um, I was actually thinking about doing a short practice, but I realized that that's taken quite a long time. So um, 
I maybe just say a little bit about practice and, and let people work with it themselves if they would like to, uh, where what I've been finding very interesting as a practice is finding a way of working with meta that uh, uses meta as a solvent. Yeah? So it's not about developing feelings of love, that if as you connect, first of all, with yourself, and then as far as you can with other people, that you, you keep that kind of sense of connection and the possibility of it going wider and wider and barriers breaking down. And that seems to be the beginning of Metta, that if you move to Karana, you then, first of all, it's quite often helpful just to notice if there's any discomfort in the body and, and just open to that. Don't reject it. Don't get attached, attached to it, but just be open to it. Just sit with it. Just hold it like the Buddha did. Yeah? You just hold it. And you could say that that will lead to compassion. There's the proviso with any of these, as I mentioned before, that if it's bringing up any kind of resentment or aversion, don't do it. Don't carry on. Don't push it. It's not about trying to get something. It's about something breaking down. Then you can move to mudita and open to... The, the positive, open to potential, open to the light in oneself and others. And then finally, try and bring that to a point of balance where you can sit with light and dark. Light depends on dark. We wouldn't have light without darkness. Darkness depends on light. We need both of them. But if you go one way or the other, you move away from the overall aim of Brahma Vihara practice. So, enough, I think. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. I think at this point, Ian, are you ready to open up to discussion and questions? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. We usually ask Noel if he'd like to kind of direct that if, um, yeah. if he's there. <laughs> Are you uh, there, Noel? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Any comments, questions? Matthew? Yeah, I just want to say uh, thanks very much for that talk here. And, uh, just a couple of points I made as you was going through that So I'll read them out what I've written down. I said, um, I avoid going over, over old ground to avoid being complacent. I've also written down to double check your knowledge to not become overconfident. Um, pride comes before a fall. And then the last bit you said at the end, I love that bit, is to not keep trying if it's going wrong. So if you're, suppose you're in a gym trying to lift this weight, you can't lift it. But if you keep trying and you keep trying, eventually you're going to damage yourself. And you're actually going to, you know, backslide in effect. So if that weight is too heavy, you should be picking up something lighter, you know, until you're ready to kind of move on to the next weight, as it were, within the analogy. Yeah. Well, not really a question, just, well, just... Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, as I, as I said, I think, um, you know, the thing that came clear to me in sort of thinking through this talk was this sort of notion uh, that we all hear about we can't you know it's easy to sort of take these things on board as ideas but actually the reality of um actually you you've got to do it for yourself we'd all we'd all like some little sort of saying or uh, idea that we can latch onto and just keep going back to, but somehow you have to 
you've got to refresh that. It has to be refreshed and you have to keep on refreshing it as much as you can. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Hi, sorry. Yes, thank you, Ian. I found that really, really useful. Um, I think you're right. I don't. I, th I think practicing the Brahma Viharas goes much, much deeper than developing particular feelings. I think it actually cuts right into insight. Um, and um, I have heard it said that um, the mind actually already is radiant with meta and compassion all of that stuff mm. uh, but what we work with is those the barrier to stop it coming through yeah, yeah. and uh, we may well hit against resistance and then working with the resistance is actually much more useful than trying to bulldoze a feeling through but yeah. that also i guess i guess the whole thing about it is that distinction between self and other which is mm. artificial anyway Mm. Um, so I think it cuts right into stuff like dependent origination and all sorts of other areas. Actually. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's just a very good area to work with because it's so much around um, our life in the world, you know, and coming up against others. Yeah. Well, I, I, just, I felt that little phrase that was in the Visuddhimagga, that the purpose of doing this is for the bliss of insight. I thought that was yeah. really interesting. So it's, it is about seeing something, but it's that arouses a, a good feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but as soon, it, it's the same thing. It, the, the problem through the Brahma Viharas and we, it's usually couched in terms of near and far enemies is either rejecting or identifying, you know, if, and you can see that the re rejection of of whatever, whichever one it is, leads you to the far enemy. Mm. And the, but the identification leads you to the near enemy. So it's pointing you all the time towards this upeka, what's mm -hmm. going on, seeing it and being able to hold both. But re also remembering that Upeka just isn't just being coldly indifferent. Is you do actually have to hold the light and the dark for and Upeka yeah. to reach fulfilment and to be purified. You know, and also that whole rejecting and identifying is what keeps us in dependent origination, isn't it? Really, because it's what what keeps maintaining that sense of self because we reject yeah. and identify all yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah. But it's a good motivator, isn't it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it works with what comes naturally and what is coming up all, all of the time. So it's a really good way in to something that's harder to see in other ways. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Guy next and then Rachel Smith. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks to Ian for such a wonderful talk and also to mention um, something that I was reminded of that Nye Boonman said, which was, um, uh, don't have any enemies, only have friends, which um, I thought was a rather sort of wonderful idea, probably difficult to put into practice. Um, I wanted to ask about how one actually, you know, works with the various categories of person that were mentioned, you know, the, the person that's suffering, neutral person, the enemy and so on. Um, I mean, I tend to think, you know, I have to sort of imagine them and try and put myself in their shoes to some extent. But mm. I, I just wondered if Ian could sort of say a bit about that, really, please. So, yeah, I uh, mean, that in, in essence, I think that's what, um, you know, that's part of that thing of breaking down barriers. That if you've, if you've got a problem with any one of those, then it could be any of them. You know, some people some people have problems with their friends, you know, and it kind of arouses sort of a version of some kind. Um, yeah, sorry, I've lost, I, I completely lost the thread. I was thinking about falling out with your friends then. Um, uh, breaking down barriers, wasn't it? Yeah, um, I think, I think the breaking down barriers is um, it is to to look carefully. At, I mean, one one of the things is to look at kamma. That's given as a suggestion. So you're actually you you may actually contemplate what that person has done to be in the position that they're in, 
or you may contemplate what you have done uh, or the way you've acted and thought and so on that led you to the place where you feel like that towards them. Um, so a lot of it is 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 really, um, you know, I, I think we don't very often use the word uh, contemplation, but I actually think I think that part of this is sort of when you hit barriers is that actually you need to do a bit of contemplation and you need to kind of remind yourself of of the direction that you would like to go in. Uh, and that that involves sort of just looking carefully and thinking through what's going on here, you know, rather than blaming them or blaming yourself, you know, it's actually just sort of looking at what's actually going on. And they do all these other things. They, there's loads and loads of pages and pages of suggestions in the Visuddhi Magga if you want to have a look through it, you know, but... Uh, you know, ultimately, the final suggestion is that if you've still got a problem with aversion, then give a gift, <laughs> which is the, fi the final answer, you know, just give a gift. That, and that's a very good way of breaking down barriers. <laughs> I did actually do that once with somebody at work or I couldn't bear. I went and bought some cakes and gave them to everybody, including him. And that was really the point of it. I mean, I didn't know that was in the Visuddhi Magga, but it did have the most amazing effect, actually. You know, most yeah. of kind of melted, you know, so it's interesting to yeah. have authority for it in the scriptures. But uh, yeah. anyway, thank you. No, I, it's, it's, I, I think a lot of people have a problem with meta practice because all they do is sit there and say, may I be well and happy. And, you know, it can work, but it can just be empty words, as you yeah. said. Yeah. 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 I, think, I think if you can... Uh, if you can sort of work on the, this idea of breaking down barriers and let the feeling take care of itself, the feeling may well up, the fe it may go very quiet, but, you know, not, not to force the feeling. And sometimes if, if barriers do break down, you know, even towards yourself, you know, there are things that we don't want to look at, you know, <laughs> in our behaviour or in our past or whatever. Uh, and sometimes if you if you're able just to see it, then that, you know, the feeling will change as a result of that. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ian, for that talk. Um, and I really enjoyed how you snuck in the Brahma Viharas to it. And I was just thinking that um, had it been titled Brahma Viharas, I might have gone, oh, I've I've seen those talks about those anyway, so I don't need to do this one. Um, and what you said about uh, resistance <laughs> really resonated with me. I often find that, you know, if I'm asked to go on a meta walk, my immediate feeling is one of irritation and annoyance. <laughs> and, um, and then I get cross with myself for feeling like that. Um, so I really, really love the notion of uh, meta as solvent. Um, and I just found that such a useful concept and I was just taken back to a practice I had the other day where I was really struggling with a lot of hindrances and um, I just saw for a moment actually how I'm attached <laughs> to them you know just saw that moment of how I really want those irritations and how hard it is to give up and um, and I found just bringing a bit of compassion to that um, just really helped soften, you know, rather than, as you say, as you're just saying about trying to um, force a feeling, you know, letting the, yeah. I love what you say about letting the feeling take care of itself. And I feel like that's often why I'm trying to force a feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Love. <laughs> and yeah. that makes me cross. <laughs> well, interestingly, I, I remember one of the Wednesday, you know, I used to host the Wednesday evening practices. And one of the people who gave a Wednesday evening talk was, actually said that uh, sometimes it it's better to start with compassion particularly if it, if there's some sort of negativity comes up you know and actually it's it's a question of just sitting with that again it's not a question of pushing it away or or feeling sorry for yourself but actually just sit with it and allow it it's just sort of allow it to change in a way isn't it you know you think it almost that feeling isn't it of 
of actually I wasn't intending to bring compassion to it, but it was a kind of I would just have a little look at that and then it sort of gradually comes, isn't it, rather than as you say. Thank you. Um, Yash and then Diana, please. Hi, thank you very much, um, Ian. That was really wonderful. Um, I uh, I just thought, uh, in, especially actually in relation to the last two um, comments, um, uh, I thought that, 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 that there's something. There's the we one of the things we think of as meta as uh, as nice, and that's one of the problems. Um, and also, <clears throat> um, we don't really start with, and as you said, really with with its um that it's 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 really being within opaca in some way and um it not be it being about not not uh, neither greed nor aversion um and one of the um particularly uh, interesting things is the sutta uh, that talks about the 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 snakes so that's not the normal meta sutta but a, a monk comes to the buddha and says um uh, another monk has died, has been bitten by a cobra. And the Buddha says the problem is he didn't have enough metta. And that the way to defeat the cobras, and that's not just snakes, but it's the snakes that rise with power, almost like the Buddha, and indeed a Buddha, Buddha often sits under one. Um, the, the way to defend against that is with metta, mm. um, the power of metta. And then there's the other story which is which comes to mind in this is uh, when uh, Devadatta, his enemy, sends the mad elephant, Nalagiri, and the mad elephant comes rushing to the Buddha. He's been drunk. Not only is he mad, but they made him drunk. Um, and he comes rushing against the Buddha and everybody's cast away. And the Buddha, the Buddha quells him with the perfection of loving kindness. Um, and it's said, actually, the, he says, the Naga Buddha meets the Naga elephant. So it's, a, the, it's an equal force. Yes. Um, and it just seems to me that that's, it's important because that really is, meta is there, uh, um, there's no boundary. Mm. It's not loving kindness in the sense of um, aversion or, or a, mm. it is just a meet, a complete direct meeting. Yes. And then something's still, the different space. Yeah. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw those stories in because in a way they're you, what you were talking about. Yeah, yes, absolutely. That's that's really good. Yeah, yeah. It's that sense of no distinction, isn't it? And I, funnily enough, it had come to mind as I was walking around here. Uh, I'd just been recollecting some of those stories of, of the forest monks meeting tigers and mm. snakes and scorpions. And, you know, I remember... Ajahn Sidiro talking about meeting, you know, a swarm of bees and all sorts of things out in the jungle. And actually, if it, rather than feel like you, I think my my image that I'd always had about the, the Buddha overcoming the elephant with metta was a bit like he was kind of pushing it away with it, with his love. And actually, it's not that at all, is it? It's just, it is actually seeing no distinction and just being completely equanimous quite it's quite interesting <laughs> say not not what we think yeah i was just saying thank you so much um ian for a really nice talk um and uh you made me laugh as well a couple of times which is always good um i can't hear you very well oh let me unplug this speaker is that any better yes yeah I had a speaker plugged in. Maybe that was uh, affecting the, the sound. Anyway, I'll just say again, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> you made me laugh a couple of times, which is uh, is always good. Um, yeah, a few things, thoughts came up in the questions as well that provoked some thoughts for me. But first of all, I just wanted to say that um, I, apparently um, the four Brahma Viharas are one way to enter jhana. Um, apart from the breath. You can also enter jhana by practicing the four Brahma yeah. Viharas, which is, you know, nice. Um, yes. But 
Yeah, in terms of people finding it difficult, um, that's that's always kind of interesting as well. I mean, I think it was Rachel was saying, and you was you know saying about the resistance that comes up. I mean, I I I never had a problem with meta towards myself, and it's not that I had a high opinion or high self esteem or anything. I'm mean, you know all, I struggle with all the same issues, but I just didn't have a problem. So it was always surprising to me when I encountered, when I was teaching the meditation group in London and then in my work in mental health, the difficulties that people have in feeling, you know, kindness towards themselves, really. Um, I I always find that really um, difficult. And I I usually try and, in terms of calling it meta loving kindness, I I usually just say kindness. Mm. 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 It gives a slightly different feeling, you know, loving kindness this might be a bit too i don't love myself you know but kind be kind to yourself yes yeah you treat somebody else like that you know that kind of thing yes exactly yeah um and the other thing was what yash was talking about with the the cobras and stuff because uh, when i used to be in australia and hear the monks talking on retreats who'd been practicing in thailand you know they told wonderful stories of there was one in particular he had a King Cobra came, you know, was in the cave where he was meditating, was right in front of him, you know, and and he practiced metta, equanimity, and Mm. didn't didn't strike him, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I didn't, um, I didn't realize how much I had to say about this, actually. I thought it was going to be shorter and thought I'd do a practice, but... um, uh, there was also the potential to uh, link the Brahma Viharas with jhana practice, which I think is a very fruitful area for investigation. And uh, in the Visuddhi Magga, they are they are linked through the four jhanas. So the first jhana is linked with metta, the second jhana with karana, third jhana with mudita, and kind of more obviously in a way the fourth jhana with upeka uh, but the 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 sign in brahma vihara practice is the breaking down of barriers that's the sign that that you work with so quite in, again you know another talk maybe sometime <laughs> thank you Ian. Yeah, I, I was so uh, in following intently, really. I would have liked to have done a practice in a way because I was sort of felt at that point, I wonder what that feels like, you know, in a number of ways. Um, Don't hold back, we'll soon be finished. <laughs> I know, I, I did. It was just dissolve, you know, it's dissolving. You know, it was like wanting to sort of get that feeling. Um, but particularly, I think that the, uh, the words you used and what you expressed is very applicable, you know, to the two situations we really encounter. And I, I was thinking very much about family feuds. I mean, I know two instances where members of families will speak to one another, you know, two brothers, I have to say, mm-hmm. who uh, uh, there is, you know, um, a barrier. Um, and sometimes that's gone on a long time. And, and it does in families. I know a few instances where it's gone on for years, actually. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, even if they don't speak to one another, there's tension sometimes. And I thought, what could I, well, what could I do? Not that I, I'm in it, but certainly what does the Dhamma do to help that? Is there a way through? Um, maybe if it's not oneself, it's it's someone near to one. Um so it's made me think, and certainly those stages, it it's, it's really requires quite an insight, doesn't it? Um, I mm-hmm. think uh, at first it's a feeling, um, you know, to overcome, you know, negativity, but it goes deeper and further. It's like saying we're all equal. The one was we're all equal, really. And then there is no distinction, you know, to really get to that sense of uh, not that we're all the same, but but there's no distinction where human beings but I did wonder how it might help to um you know help resolve family conflicts yeah. and the other the other thing that was very uh, strong really about the light and the dark aspects which was as you say a slightly 
um, new slant on, on, on those aspects of the Brahma Viharas. And this is sort of a bit of personal sort of story uh, because there's been a lot of joy in the fact that my daughter's had a baby and it's in tremendous joy, you know. But that at the same time, just more recently, the father-in-law's been seriously ill and is facing a very, very difficult time. Mm. And the sadness is so strong as well, you know, particularly in sort of the sun. Mm. It's the one and then the other. And now that's life, you say, that, that's life. You know, it's not going to stay happy forever. Um, but it's finding, I want to help them try and find a way, if I can, you know, where they're not mm. totally obsessed with the sadness, mm. but um, don't, ignore you know it's that it is life isn't it yeah yeah i think that's that's a difficult so that's a difficult thing to do and it, it, it was sort of coming to mind as you were talking about family feuds and wanting to help because i think i think this is the thing that a lot of us it's we we kind of fall into that desire to help and um one of the things that's come to me from looking at this is something to do with not pushing things onto people. Um, you know, that actually the best thing you can do, I hope you can still hear me, Veronica, because you've kind of frozen now. Um, but one of the best things that you can do is actually just to hold the middle or hold that sense of meta or or lack of barriers. So, uh, you might have to look at this on the recording if you've gone. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, thank you very much, Ian. That was a really lovely talk. I really enjoyed listening to it. Um, just a couple of, 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 of uh, reflections, really. One is uh, that I've just sort of found uh, useful from time to time over the years. One is, uh, and they're both related, uh, but you know, coming in from slightly different angles. One's a pleasant one, and one's a slightly sobering thought. The first one is it's a fairly common Mahayana practice, which I think is not really inconsistent with anything in the Theravada, which is this reflection that at, all, at some point um, all beings have been our mother in a past life, and that's a useful reflection to make. Uh, in the, it is actually mentioned in the Visuddhimagga as well as one of the, right, one of good. one of the ways of getting rid of resentment is to remember yeah. that we're related. We're all related. <laughs> And then the other one, which is a, a little bit more sobering, is just the reflection that, um, you know, in the fullness of time, given that our own beginnings have no, there is no discernible beginning to when we first started our journey. Um, in, in the fullness of time, we will have presumably, most of us, all of us will have experienced existence in all of the different realms at some point, mm -hmm. including the lower worlds. And mm -hmm. so we will have committed deeds that will have landed us in those lower realms. And those deeds are likely to be significantly more unwholesome than whatever it is we have a problem with with anyone we encounter in this lifetime yeah and just uh, yeah yeah i think i think these things are useful they, these are the kind of contemplations that may be useful but you do have to be quite watchful of which way the mind's going you know like i say if it's moving towards rejection or it's moving towards identifying and getting caught on either of those, remember that that's not the main aim of the practice, you know, that the, the aim is to break down barriers and stay in the middle, you know, yeah. Okay, and just, just one final thing, which I think has not come up yet, uh, which is I've heard uh, Nye Brunman twice over the years, once I believe at a public talk in Manchester about 20 years ago, and once about three or four years ago at Green Street, make the connection between the different stages of our practice and the Brahma Vihara. So in, in other words, every time we practice counting, we are in fact developing loving kindness. Every time we're practicing following, we're actually developing compassion and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, with the touching and uh, you know, sympathetic joy and with um, settling and equanimity, and uh, I've certainly found that experientially, uh, having observed it quite closely over the years, to, to be true. And it does, uh, you know, there's potentially something in there in terms of when we try to practice metta in the more formal sense, you know, it might be helpful to prelude it with the appropriate stage of our practice. Yeah. 
yeah i think i think it's a very fruitful area for investigation yeah right okay uh, so is about patient that um when you were mentioning uh, some of the things that are described about meta that one of the things is of developing patience and i've always i've always kind of wondered you know as a as a parami as a perfection you know kind of where that comes in mm. and mm. that's quite an interesting insight into it so Ian, I didn't know if there's anything more you wanted to say about patients. Um, <laughs> not really. Um, one, well, the only the only other thing that I would like to say about patients, and it did it did come up for me, and it, I think it kind of relates to a number of comments that people have made, is about is about having patience with this practice. That you know, part of, certainly part of the problem I had was wanting to get this, you know, wanting to get this feeling, wanting to be there. And one of the things that seems quite clear in the instructions that are given is is this thing about don't don't try and run before you can walk, you know, just just be patient and keep just keep going back to what you can allow it to extend as far as it will if you can't you know if you can't uh, get a sense of uh, connection with yourself then don't try and connect with the whole world you know just kind of you know just sort of allow it to develop in its own time and it, its own rate um but um i i don't think i'd yeah, I, yeah there's nothing else i particularly wanted to say about it oh yes Thank you very much, Ian. I really enjoyed that talk um, and it's very helpful. I've just got three very quick things to say. First of all, um, I do remember Ajahn Sadiro once said to me that uh, he thought patience was the most important um, attribute in, in, in practice. I was very astounded at it, actually, but I can see what he meant. The other thing um, is that... Uh, when, when certainly in the past, I've always um, found that in my mind, to see us all, myself and everyone else, as suffering has, has helped to break down the barriers. Now, I know that, um, you know, we, we think about suffering and compassion, uh, but I sort of saw it in terms of meta as well, mm. that um, being able to see that we all suffer that's what we all have in common um uh, kind of help to break down the barriers to a certain extent at least and there was a third thing i wanted to say but i'm afraid i can't remember it well i i while i can still remember my answers um i was going to say that that thing about patience i think it might have been the last full moon i'm not sure but there was a one of the full moons there was a huge gathering of arahats the buddha was with hundreds and thousands of arahats and he gave a dhamma talk and and the talk he gave was about patience and i always thought that was really fascinating if you what would you talk about with a bunch of arahats you know i'll, I'll teach them about patience you know so uh, <laughs> there's obviously a lot to do there yes. uh, the other thing, uh, yeah, I've got the same problem now. What was the second thing you mentioned? <laughs> uh, it was about, um, the, the break, for me, the breaking down of barriers is seeing everyone, including myself, yes. as, as suffering. We all suffer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've always found that really quite helpful, actually. Yeah, yes. I now remember the third thing I wanted to say. We haven't actually mentioned fear, but it seems to me that um, what you've been talking about and other people have been mentioning as, as well is actually, it does away with fear. You can't have fear if you have established meta and compassion and, and the other two within oneself. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, but some, sometimes though, 
the re you know i think the reason why we have fear or or put up barriers is a as a kind of protection because mm-hmm. because we're not ready to look at something and so i wouldn't i'm not urging people you know break down all the barriers and just go for you know i think you just you do have to work your way towards it and uh, you know do, do a step at a time you know mm-hmm. yeah. thank you can you hear me okay because i've got my speaker on can you hear okay yep good uh ian thank you so much for a really wonderful talk so helpful i've been scribbling down i've run out of paper i've scribbled down so many things (laughs) but uh, i just wanted knowledge is knowledge is not information (laughs) (laughs) too true Uh, and so you just kind of remind me to, to try and think of these things. But uh, I just wanted to share something, which I think I have mentioned before. The the Russian word for friend, drug or druga, is the meaning is my other myself. Mm. And mm-hmm. I often try to bring that to mind because, as Marjorie was saying, you know, it's so... It's so good to remember that people, we all suffer and we all want to be happy. That's the other part of it. And if I can remember that, um, it really does help. But um, when you were talking about um, bringing to mind these various other people, dear ones, neutral ones, and people you don't like, I always find it very easy to feel for the ones that I love dearly and also to know quite well who are the people that I'm struggling with or resent or hate. It's the neutral ones that I I just go sort of blank and indifferent. And I'm sure that's not what it's supposed to be. Could you say something about neutrality? No, I, I I think it's a very interesting point actually, and uh, it touches on something about the nature of Upeka uh, and you know the the near enemy of Upeka being indifference, you know. So it's clearly not about you know. Don't, don't know how to put it. You know, it's not a it's not a sort of rejection of people, and and it's not about bringing them all in, but but it's somehow about giving equal weight. There was that you know that interesting comment about the bandits who wanted a sacrifice, and when you can't see any distinction between any of the the four types, then you know, you know, you've you've got to that point. But it's clearly it's clearly not an easy point to get to. Um, but maybe you know I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk about about opening the senses, and sometimes it's quite interesting with neutral people to just sort of really look at them. You know, maybe when you're out on the street and just sort of really, really kind of. Uh, make contact connect in some way it's just a thought really thank you ian for a really interesting talk um i wanted to pick up on the point of uh, dissolving boundaries and something i find really useful recently is uh exploring the the rupa practice um, obviously, one of the things we have to do is expand our boundaries and dissolve boundaries in the in the first Arupa Jhana. I I had the experience recently of just creating that great space. Really arises the feeling of patience, and um, like you said, I, I have great difficulty just arising meta generating the feeling and I wonder if actually creating space and dissolving boundaries was a way in from 
the head to the heart rather than starting with the heart. I just comments. I, I think that, I think that's right, uh, and the simple fact with a lot of the the things that we do relating to practice is that we often get ideas, don't we? We get ideas about things. Um, you kind of work, it, I guess it's a bit like I was saying before about knowledge not being information, you know, that you get these ideas, but somehow you have to marry that with experience. And, and you've got to, and, and it's actually something to do with that kind of marriage that's quite interesting. I, I don't think they're unrelated, the formless and the Brahma Viharas, but it's quite clear that the Brahma Viharas relates to beings. And, uh, you know, the Arupa practice, I think, is, you know, using a rather different object. But there's something, again, I think it's it's just a, you know, source of investigation, really. You know, yeah. watch this watch this space. <laughs> it, was really, it was really touching on um, the feeling of patience. It seems to be something that's been brought up today. And it also seems to be a common prerequisite for all the Brahma Viharas, Metta, Karana, Mudita, and Upeka, whether that's patience with oneself or yeah. uh, patience with Dukkha yeah. or patience with the dark and the light. Yeah. Uh, it, again, it's made quite clear in the Visuddhimagga that there is actually no distinction between the four Brahma Viharas. I think equanimity is definitely seen as the pinnacle of, of the Brahma Viharas, but the, in a, it says quite clearly that there is no distinction. It is only the sign that is different. So, you know, they have a, you know, maybe a kind of slightly different flavor, different mark, but it's ultimately they're, they're the same thing, you know. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I just want to mention Marion about the about the middle way, about um, about balance. I've never really understood that exact concept about when something's balanced and it's exactly still and it's not moving. I've never really understood it in that way, whether or not that's what you meant, but balanced, I feel that balance isn't really the best word. I feel like it's more like a synergy, it's more like a combination, it's more like, you know, the light and the dark kind of working, to, kind of working together. It's yeah. more like a fusion rather than a balance of something, you know, being perfect, perfectly still. Yes. Imagine, imagine being a kid on a seesaw. If that seesaw is exactly still, yes, nothing's happening. But when it's when it's moving back and forth like this, it's a bit of fun. Yeah, but I think there is there is something about it being. It is a kind of fine point, mm. you know, being able to hold both sides. You know, it requires being at a at a fine point. Uh, and it's a bit like something that you have to keep checking. <laughs> you know, you can't you can't just go there and oh, I'm I'm there. I'll stay there now. You know, it's uh, you, it's uh, something to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now I'm going to have the problem of remembering <laughs> what Matthew just said. Just triggered off a thought for me because I thought um, whenever I think of the balance thing, I always think of surfing you know, a surfer who is always perfectly balanced with it being, you know, these massive waves, but they, they, they surf the waves. Yeah. So, and also I heard a good Dharma talk on Thursday, the eye of the storm. So it's like being at that point in the middle of it, all the turbulence where you are perfectly balanced all the time. So there's always movement, but you're in perfect balance. And, um, just the other thing, a couple of things I want to say was the aversion. I always, I mean, rather the hindrance that you call ill will. I always prefer to think of it for myself as aversion. Because, and boredom and fear fall into this category. It's, it's basically anything we don't want. It doesn't necessarily have to have a strong feeling of ill will, but there's always, I don't want this, you know, whatever it is, you know, even consciously or unconsciously. Yeah. 
And the third thing was about what Liz said about the neutral, which I, I sort of feel the same in a way. You know, it's always difficult to who's a neutral person because whoever I bring to mind is always some flavor. Even if I see people randomly in the street, you know, there's always, oh, I'm a bit, I like that person or I don't like, just subtly, you know, some projection going on. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe what you said about people that you don't know, just all beings or something, and you're yeah. really a neutral person to mind, you know? Yes. It is, I understand, you know, what Liz was saying, it's, it's tricky. Yes, and, and I think, yeah, you, you have to work with these things. They don't, I, you know, they, in my experience anyway, they don't just come easily. And we very easily, we very easily fall one way or the other. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just our natural tendency. And again, you have to be patient and kind towards that, you know. <laughs> and don't, don't beat yourself up about it. You know, that's that's the way it is. And it uh, but but it it is the way, it is the way that we move. And it's often these kind of coming back to old things and realizing that you see them in a different way, that you know, that things do shift over time, you know. Yeah. Um I think some of these have been said in a different way, but when Fran asked a question about uh, patience, I remember when practicing the Parmis quite a while ago, there was this book about uh, the, orna the jewel ornament of liberation, which is Parmis of the, um, the Bodhisattva way. And they described it in great detail on the definition of patience as a feeling of ease. And then he says, it's a mind without confusion. Uh, a feeling of ease accompanied by compassion. And he says that this is how a definition of a bodhisattva's patience is. So I thought I'd just mention it because Fran asked that question. Mm -hmm. Then he describes um, three classifications, that there's a patience of feeling ease towards someone harmful, and that is done by investigating the nature of that person, which I think Ian mentioned about karma. And the second one is the patience of accepting suffering, and it is uh, investigating Dukkha. And the third one, he says, is patience is an understanding the nature of Dhamma itself, which is the uh, ultimate reality side, uh, which uh, is practicing um, the unmistakable nature of all phenomena, which I think also got mentioned as dependent. Mm -hmm. origination Deborah mentioned it so mm -hmm. in in this book they give so many great details mm -hmm. on how to practice patience and uh, I think it's just you know your, your attitude of find out for yourself and do it in a different way <laughs> I thought I'd share that reference if anybody's yeah interested. yeah well you know it, it, you do have to you do have to it still have to investigate these things yeah. to find out what they mean for you don't you you know yes interesting you know People have mentioned that word boredom again. Uh, mm -hmm. I get. I, I mentioned that one of the um, one of the translations uh, for arati is discontent. Mm -hmm. So you could say, and being contented uh, is almost like a, that's almost like a definition of patience, isn't it? It's actually just yeah. being contented with what is, you know, and not trying to change it and rush it and you know. it comes in the mangala sutta doesn't it arati virati papa yeah uh, so it is one of the good fortunes when we can overcome <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. thank you okay i'm going to draw attention to some of the comments in the in the chat box and then um, unless there are any further comments, I'll move it back to Veronica. So Peter Harvey, who had to leave, said that uh, the reflection, I see you, see me, may help break down barriers. Um, Anne Portis uh, says that uh, also for those people who have difficulty noticing sensation in the body and heart when practicing metta, know that it is a state of mind, not a feeling. So um, as much so intention is a good place to start. So in, it's not a feeling as such, so intention is a good place to start. And then uh, a request from Anne um, 
Skeletsi to uh, to uh, Usha, could you please send that link from what you've just uh, been talking about? Is that Usha? Yeah. Uh -huh. Usha. Um, I'll send it to you directly, Anne. Okay. Thank you. And do we have any um, final comments? before I hand it back to Veronica, who I believe has rejoined us. Can I just have one? Hi, Noel. Can I just have one? So much time has taken up, and I, and I don't want to take any more time, because I think so much has been said. First, I'd just like to say thank you to Ian, because uh, it's been really helpful to make connections all the time when you hear so much about uh, <clears throat> these things. But what also sprung to mind is, I think, interpretation and whether loving kindness is the best or in a way the only interpretation for metta and whether we sometimes shy away from the word love and unconditional love and the progress from conditional love so i like you because you make nice tea or you you look this way to the progress to unconditional love which may be associated with a pay cup so i do feel sometimes that we shy away from the word love yeah, and for me, love is uh, something very strong in the way you, you look at the practice. Um, and I feel sometimes loving kindness doesn't feel as strong connection as sometimes when you use the word love in the practice. So I'm just wondering, do we have a phobia? Uh, uh, quite rightly sometimes because of sensuality and, and attraction, but do we have a phobia about the use of the word love and unconditional love? And somehow we just shy away to more technical terms. And that may be a barrier. Anyway, thank you again. Uh, it's coming right at the end. And I know people may want to get away, but it's just something I wanted to just to kind of think about anyway. We're ready to finish the meeting now. I don't know how we want to finish it. Ian, is it, uh, do we do a blessing? Sometimes we do, sometimes uh, we just yeah. um, what, what might, it just occurred to me that what might be nice because one of the things about zoom is you can see so many people at one time you might want to um just be aware of that just in whatever way works for you just that sense of breaking down barriers and we have all of these uh friends who are uh working in their own way maybe towards uh similar ends who knows but uh, yeah, maybe we'll finish with a, a blessing. Uh, I'll chant a blessing. And as we chant the blessing, then uh, just, uh, just be aware of the beings on screen and those beyond, all the ones that are connected to all of these people and who are connected to them and who are connected to them and who are connected to them. And just let it go as far as you wish. Bawa to Sabba Manga Langra Kan to Sabba Devata Sabba Buddhan Ubawe Nasada Soti Bawan to Te Bawa to Sabba Manga Langra Kan to Sabba Devata Sabba Dhamman Ubawe Nasada Soti Bawan to Te Bawa to Sabba Manga Langra can to Samba de Wata Samba Sanghanu Bawena Sada Soti Bawan to Te Sadu 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 Sadu